Wow, that is loud. Good evening, everybody. I'm glad to see a really good turnout tonight. We have Dr. Chris Benner with us from University of California, Davis. Just for the record, I'm Theron Westrope from Literature and Language Arts. I'll be your host tonight. And when we get to the Q&A session after Dr. Brenner's talk, I'll be helping you with facilitating your questions. And we'll have runners throughout um, bringing you microphones that you can ask Dr. Brenner questions about his presentation. Um, I want to give him a very brief introduction. I think most of what he does is going to be covered in his talk. But I learned earlier that his studies overlap many disciplines. And basically, if you want to get it down to a point, it's about city and regional plan at the beginning, right? At the beginning of your studies, but now it's broadened out into everything that's relevant to the demographics, economics, <laughs> everything there is to know about a community and the way that it's built, right? Okay. So please welcome once again Dr. Chris Brenner. We'll turn it over to him right now. Well, um, thank you all for coming out tonight. Uh, well, you have the microphone in part because we're recording um, back here. So if you know of anyone who didn't make it tonight who might want to see the talk, it'll be up online at some point. Um, I want to thank the organizers of the Civic Engagement Project for inviting me here tonight. It's actually a real honor to come to Modesto. I I've been at UC Davis for about seven years now in a community and regional development program where we do a fair amount of work with communities up and down the San Joaquin Valley, uh, but have yet to do work in Modesto. Um, and so it's a chance for me to get to know your community a little bit. And I really appreciate being here and your interest. What I'm going to do tonight uh, is talk about uh, social equity and economic growth uh, and the links between those two things that people don't often think go together. Uh, and so I want to do that in part by talking about the nature of our current economic crisis in this country. And as part of that, talking a little bit about some of the dynamics here in Modesto. But then point to some of the research that I've done, along with a colleague of mine at the University of Southern California, a guy named Manuel Pastor, looking at successful regions around the country that have been able to link growth and equity together. And how is that possible? Um, and I'm going to finish up with a little bit on uh, education and adult education and the importance of that. But before we get too deeply into that topic, I, I want to put in your mind that we are experiencing in this country a dramatic economic restructuring. And in my view, it's as dramatic as the first industrial revolution where well, we first had the assembly line and manufacturing. And the core of that industrial revolution was the ability to harness energy and to apply that energy to all sorts of human activities. And part of what makes it so revolutionary is its pervasiveness, that energy is important for all activities, including manufacturing. Um, moving cars and you know the distributed network that's all connected into that. And if you think about a prototypical manufacturing industry that was the result of that control of energy, steel's a pretty good one. I used to teach at Penn State University and spend a lot of time in Pittsburgh. And the core of a steel industry is transforming materials. In this case, iron ore, limestone, all the materials that go into steel production. And in that context, um, can you all see that okay? I guess. <laughs> Lights going on and off. <laughs> Somewhere in between. <laughs> see, we aren't perfect at controlling energy now either, are we? <laughs> we try. All right, fair enough. Uh, but in that industry, you'd have relative stability in work and careers. I mean, literally multiple generations of families working in the same plant. And that, mostly men, 
Um, so there was a whole gender dynamic to it, of course. But that created the basis for the growth of the middle class in this country and stable communities and all that goes along with that. And you had a single employer who largely controlled the conditions of employment in that factory and ultimately unions and a collective bargaining arrangement and a national labor relations system that regulated that employment agreement, eight hour workday, and all that went along with that. And education in our society at that point was primarily about early years of life, right? Someone goes through K through 12 and ideally gets into the workforce or maybe goes on to college and gets into the workforce and that was enough and everything else you learned on the job to do your work. So the current economic revolution we're in the midst of is the control of information and the technologies that allow us to harness and manipulate and process information and apply that to every aspect of human life and existence, whether it's social media, whether it's semiconductors, whether it's the internet, whether it's healthcare and all the biological components of that, it's the control and harnessing of information that's part of that. And Silicon Valley is of course the iconic place of the information revolution. Uh, and I say a place because you could talk about a company, U.S. Steel, in the industry of steel, but it's hard to talk about an individual company in the information economy because it changes so rapidly and the country, you know, companies switch. Um, and these are just a few indicators of that from research I was doing in Silicon Valley in the 1990s, that in that decade of rapid growth of the internet, the World Wide Web, and it's continued today, um, the majority of all job growth occurs in companies that don't even exist today. I mean, over that decade of the 1990s, 87% of all jobs that grew were in firms that didn't exist at the beginning of the decade. And that in those kind of core IT industries, the established firms that exist in 1990 um, actually lost jobs, lost about 120,000 jobs of companies that exist in 1990, whereas new companies that formed uh, created 260,000 new jobs. And if you look at the top 100 companies, and I've followed this now for 25 years, and these are companies that are top by total revenue, I mean these are successful companies, the half-life of them is about seven years. So within about seven years, you can assume that half of the companies in the top 100 in Silicon Valley have gone out of business, have merged, have somehow changed their economic structure, they no longer exist. Um, the median length of time that someone's in a job, not two generations, but two and a half years. So how do you plan for long-term stability in that context? Um, and of course we have skills obsolescence, that so what you know today is going to be irrelevant five years from now, ten years down the road. And so what we need to think about in education is about lifelong learning and what are the institutions and support people need to be able le to learn for a lifetime. So that's the picture I want to have in your mind as we talk about the current crisis and some of the lessons from these regional economies. Um, and what I think of as how do we make lemonade out of lemon? or you know, get the wolf and the kitten to sit down together. Because um, I think there's tremendous excitement in this new economy, but it's going to take some pretty dramatic changes in how we structure our governance systems and society to really deal with it effectively. So first, the economic crisis. And I think there's three dimensions of the economic crisis. One dimension that's getting a lot of um, publicity has to do with jobs and the relationship between economic growth and jobs. We have been in recovery from the Great Recession since the summer of 2009. So here we are, four and a half, five years later, however many, my math's not very good, I'm a social scientist. Um, and our job growth has just barely caught up to where it was before the recession began. So the blue line there is economic growth, and you can see my little laser isn't working very well, but the beginning there is um, where the economic recovery started. It took two to three years for, economic, for job creation to kick in, and then even then it's been very slow. This is pretty well understood amongst economists at the moment in this current jobless recovery. 
What's a little less well understood is how deeply rooted that disconnection between economic growth and jobs has become. If we look at every recession going back to the 1960s up until 1989 and look at the recovery out of those recessions, as soon as economic growth started, job creation started. So that's what all those lines show there is as soon as economic growth starts, job creation starts. But look at the recovery in 1991, flat job growth for about two and a half, three years before job creation took off. And the 2001 recovery, even worse. The decades of the 2000s was a tremendous job list recovery. And this is our current economic recovery. So something pretty dramatic happened in that 1990 period that enabled companies and the economy to grow without creating jobs. And you can imagine all the things that go into that. Part of it is things going on in the global economy, the opening up of China and the Soviet Union, and the ability of companies to move overseas more easily and grow in that way rather than creating jobs in the US. There's new technologies. The internet, of course, takes off during this time. The ability to gain greater efficiencies uh, without hiring new workers. So it's creating real challenges for us on um, our job creation side. But there's also a challenge around economic growth. Uh, in the 50s and 60s, we used to average about 4% a year annual GDP, gross domestic product increase. That started to decline in the economic crises of the 1970s. So in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, it was about 3% growth a year. In the most recent couple decades, we're lucky to average about 2% economic growth a year. So that's kind of one dimension of the economic crisis. Tied to that is a second dimension, which is the growth in inequality in our society. And I could bore you for hours with different statistics about how to um, understand different inequality, but I'll spare you that. I, I uh, save that for my students. They pay for the privilege to have me bore them for hours on end. Um, but one key indicator here is the percentage of total income captured by the top 10% of income earners. And this is going back to 1917. And what you'll see is in the early part of the decade, high levels of inequality, in fact, it peaked at almost 50% of income in the country captured by the top 10% just before the Great Depression. And then we had the most equal period of, economic, of uh, income distribution in this country in the 50s and 60s when we had the highest periods of economic growth. As economic growth declines, as we have this growing inequality, they're very tied together and up into a point now where we're up again, we're close to 50% of total income is captured by just the top 10% of income earners. This doesn't say anything about wealth, this is just income. And those feed each other, both in terms of the lack of spending power and consumer power, about those being left out, um, leads to greater stagnation in the economy overall. The concentration of wealth at the very top ends up in that investments going in financial markets all over the globe rather than reinvested in our national economy. So at a time, uh, actually sorry, I wanted to, before jumping into the third dimension of the crisis, does it give you a bit of statistics on California and Modesto? So California has become one of the most unequal states in the country. I mean, we used to think of California as the land of opportunity. It's now the uh, sixth or seventh most unequal state. We're kind of on a par with uh, Mississippi, Louisiana, Georgia, Alabama. Those are our peers in terms of income uh, inequality. Uh, and of course, the racial dimensions of that are very strong. And so this shows you uh, median household income by race. Asian population in California has about 75,000 household income on average. African American and Latino populations less than 50,000, so about 40% less. Um, and that's very important because where is the future of California? The future of California is in our Latino population. And what this chart shows is the ethnic composition of Stanislaus County. Modesto uh, Metropolitan Statistical Area. And at the moment in 2010, already it's a majority minority county. Uh, Non-Hispanic whites were about 47% of the population in 2010. By 2040, 
the non-Hispanic white population of Stanislaus County is projected to be 27%, whereas the Latino population is about 65% by that point. Now, one of the dimensions of this rapid demographic change is what we call the racial uh, uh, demographic gap, the racial age gap. And if you look at the percentage of the over 65 population who are non-Hispanic white, in Modesto, it's now um, 27%. If you look at the percentage of youth, those under 18, who are people of color, it's about 67%. That's a 40% difference in this age racial gap. Um, and it's hard to see on this map, but um, Modesto actually ranks near the top of the top 100 metropolitan regions in the country in that racial demographic gap. Now, why is that important? Well, if you think about those who are over 65, they tend to be the real leaders in local communities. They're the ones who vote more prominently. They're the ones who tend to be uh, engaged in local politics and city hall. They tend to be respected community leaders. They really set the tone for the community. Um, they tend to pay less attention to issues that are important for the youth population. Their kids are out of the house, gone somewhere else. And who are the youth in Modesto? It's predominantly kids of color. And one thing that we've noticed nationally is that those states that have a larger gap between the older population and the younger population on these demographics, and that's on the right side here, the ones with the greater gap, tend to spend less on education as a percentage of their per capita income. Right. Now, I don't know if that's the case in Modesto, but nationally, this is where it is. And here's where California is, far on that right side of less spending on education, in part because of that racial demographic gap. We can see some of those statistics in Modesto. What this shows on the black line at the top there is the projected educational uh, requirements for job growth in the coming decade. And an estimated 44% of jobs in 2020 will require um, at least a, a two-year degree, associate's degree, some higher education. Um, even the US-born non-Hispanic white population is not meeting that in Modesto at the moment. Only 31% of adults in Modesto have that educational requirement. The Latino immigrant population is only about 7.5% that have that level of educational attainment. So again, if you think of our future, the youth of color, we got a big problem. The best predictor of what our economic growth rate is going to be in 2020 is the high school and college graduation rate of our young youth of color. So we should care about that just because of social values and caring about the least among us. But we should care about that because of economic growth if we want to have a successful economy. Have I depressed you all enough yet? I promise I'm going to provide a little more inspirational stories. <laughs> I just want to make sure we have a sense of the condition we're in. So major economic crisis, major demographic shifts, major inequality crisis, just at a time when we need visionary leaders in the country to help us understand this transition, what do we have? In Washington, we have increasing partisan fighting. Right? And the story that's often told these days is that, well, after the 2008 election, there was a rise up of the Tea Party and conservative opposition that won majorities in state houses in the 2010 period, created um, new districts, congressional districts, that are now safe. And so people are more concerned about competitors in the primaries than in the general election, because it's only about a handful, a couple handfuls, maybe 35, 40 of congressional districts in the country that are considered competitive. But it turns out that partisanship is bipartisan and has been going on for many decades. And that's what this chart shows, is that for both Republicans and Democrats, those that are aligned only with party votes has increased over time pretty dramatically. 
Um, and the resulting effectiveness in Congress is a decrease in passing laws and legislature to deal with these crises. This chart shows the number of laws that Congress has passed from 1947 up to 2014. The last Congress that just ended at the end of 2014 was not the worst in history on this metric. It was the second worst because they passed a few more laws in the last months in December. Um, the worst sign of this for me, though, is when you ask people their um, confidence in Congress. Of course, approval ratings are at its historic low. My favorite one was the survey that asked people to compare Congress with other unpleasant things and to rate them. So outpolling Congress was a lice, a colonoscopy, root canals, used car salesmen. Uh, Congress did manage to outpoll uh, uh, schoolyard bullies and telemarketers. So there's a bar for you. Um, <laughs> that's a great poll, actually. You should check it out. Um, but I think more importantly, or underpinning this partisanship that's happening in Congress and sort of the gerrymandering of districts and, space and uh, safe districts is an increasing spatial sorting that's been happening in this country, an increasing separation of people. Now, it's actually not so much by race. I mean, we've always had high levels of racial segregation in the country, and it's actually getting slightly less. But it's happening more by income and by ideology. What these maps show is the percentage, or the counties where one presidential candidate or another, you know, red for Republican, blue for Democrat, won by a landslide in the presidential election, so more than 20 points greater than the national average. In 1992, only about a quarter of voters lived in those kind of counties. By 2012, it was over half of the U.S. population. Um, if you look at it by income in 1970, what's happening there in those middle bars is um, people who live, this is the median uh, income of the neighborhood in which people live. And the very lowest bar is uh, poor neighborhoods, concentrated poor neighborhoods, and the very highest bar is concentrated wealthy neighborhoods. So those um, families that live in either highly affluent or highly poor neighborhoods has doubled over that 30-year period um, from about uh, one-sixth of the population to about one-third of the population. So we're spatially sorting into our own homogenous type neighborhoods. But even underpinning that, I think, is a fragmentation of the very information sources that we depend on to understand what's going on in our society and our surrounding communities. Uh, it seems to come to a point, I mean, Thomas Jefferson talked about it in 1789, whenever the people are well informed, they can be trusted with their own government. But now it's always the joke of like, truth doesn't matter in politics anymore. It's almost the facts don't really matter. But part of that is because, well, what are the information sources that we get to understand what's going on in our society? We're down to the point, this is readership of newspapers, whether it's online or in person. And we're down to less than 30% of the population under 34 who read a daily newspaper. Um, it's under 50% of the population from 35 to 54. So if you're not reading a newspaper daily to know what's going on in society, where are you getting it? Well, it's from the narrow casting of cable television, or it's from the internet. And part of what's happening with the internet is that as we get, well, one is people choose the websites that they want to go to, and it's sort of custom information. And so, you know, some of us listen to NPR and, you know, read the Huffington Post, and others, you know, read the Wall Street Journal and go to, you know, Tea Party Patriot websites. Um, but this is also happening through automatic algorithms that we're not even aware of. You know that Google searches and Facebook news streams are customized to what you typically search for and what you want to get. Eli Pariser is the founder or executive director of MoveOn.org and wrote a great book called The Filter Bubble that that image is taken from, where we're filtering out the information that doesn't accord with our perspective of the world automatically. And he showed this an example of he had two of his friends, one a um, liberal or progressive friend, the other a conservative one. The liberal, you know, Googled BP and got all sorts of news about the uh, oil spill in the Gulf. 
The other one Googled BP and got all sorts of investment information. At the same time, the progressive one Googled Egypt and got news about the protests and what was going on in Tahrir Square. The other got travel information and tourism info. So we're fragmented as a society in the very information we get. Now I've really depressed you all, I'm sure. <laughs> but here's my point from tonight, is that we think, Manuel and I and others, that lessons for how to deal with this three dimensions of our national economic crisis are emerging from a handful of regions around the country that have been successful over the last 30 to 40 years during this period of economic restructuring in creating not just growth, but in creating just growth. That is economic growth with social justice. And I'm gonna tell you a few stories about some of those places now. So let's start with Jacksonville, Florida. Um, Jacksonville is a place that in the 1960s uh, had civil rights activists trying to integrate the lunch counters at the local um, Walgreens, similar to their compatriots in Greensboro. Uh, and this is what political dialogue looked like in Jacksonville in 1964. Similar if anyone's seen the movie Selma and the beating up of the protesters there. Here it was um, white segregationists who handed out axe handles and beat up the protesters. It became known as Axe Handle Saturday in Jacksonville. The police not only didn't intervene to protect the protesters, they actually actively stayed aside until the protesters started defending themselves and grabbing back the axe handles, and then the police came in and started breaking things up and bashing the protesters. Something like 60 people ended up in hospital that day. The mayor, who was an avowed segregationist, went on national radio and praised the police for their activities during the day. Um, and it's interesting, there's almost no archival footage of what happened that day. They've tried to erase it from the history of Jacksonville. There's actually now a uh, documentary out, but it's very hard to get photos or imagery of what happened. So that's the challenge that Jacksonville faced in 1964. And what happened subsequently? Well, one thing they did is they got rid of local government uh, of the city. It's one solution. Uh, the way they did that is they merged the city of Jacksonville with its surrounding county and created a single city government that was essentially the whole regional economy. And it's still today the largest city by land area in the lower 48. And why is that important? Well, if you think of a place like Detroit, and what's happened during this time is there's flight to the suburbs of jobs and people and white flight, leaving the central city with less economic resources, aging infrastructure, higher development costs, less of a tax base, and so they have to you know, raise the taxes. You get a very vicious cycle in those central cities, whereas in the suburbs you have good jobs, new infrastructure, less costs, good tax base, good schools. You get this virtuous cycle going on in the suburbs. But in Jacksonville, it's all one city. And so you can cross-subsidize and move taxes around from one place to the other, and it brings people together in that process. The other thing they did, though, is create something called the Jacksonville Community Council. Small, nonprofit organization, group of citizens, who started in the early 70s, and this was actually started by the Chamber of Commerce, to bring together citizens. And one thing they've done is publish annually now, for close to 40 years, an indicator report on key changes in Jacksonville. Uh, politics, economics, you know, the education system, social conditions, and it becomes an important base of information for people living in the area. But they also created a process of community councils. They get 20 to 25 people together who are willing to commit to come together for a year-long dialogue. And the people are chosen deliberately to reflect the diversity of opinions and perspectives and experiences in the region. And they come together once a week for a whole year, three hours every night, to investigate a key problem or issue in the region. Could be everything from high levels of teenage pregnancy, to dropout rates, to redevelopment of the airport, to growing green jobs, to dealing with race relations. Those are all issues that they've touched on over the years. And they come up over that course of a year of dialogue with a set of recommendations. They're meeting with stakeholders, they're meeting with researchers, they're trying to figure out how to deal with this issue, and they come up with a set of recommendations. And what's critical is it's not a process where you're trying to get 50% plus one. It's not a majority vote. 
It's a process where they have to come to sufficient consensus where you're dealing with the concerns and understandings of everyone in the community in coming up with these recommendations. Now, what's the result in Jacksonville? Well, over the 20-year period from 1980 to 2000, which was a period we were looking at at this time, Jacksonville grew twice as fast as the average metropolitan region in the U.S. South and managed to reduce inequality at a time when most metro regions were getting more unequal. Now, I want to say just briefly um, about some of the economic theory behind this, because those of you who've had the misfortune to uh, have to sit through an undergraduate economics class probably were told that there's a trade-off between efficiency and equity, that if you're going to intervene in the market to promote social goods, you'll have a cost in economic efficiency, because markets operate most effectively without being intervened. And there's a bunch of reasons why people make that argument. But what's interesting is there's a growing perspective within the economics profession, and it's led by such radical leftist organizations as the Federal Reserve Bank, uh, the International Monetary Fund, and others that are finding that in practice, places that are more equitable grow faster. And that's true whether it's at a metropolitan scale in the US or when you're looking at countries internationally. And a set of reasons that are not simply about Keynesian economics of macroeconomic demand, but it has to do with patterns of political conflict and social conditions that seem to facilitate economic growth when you have um, greater equity. And we can talk a little bit more about that. And so the research that Manuel and I have done now um, in a couple of different books, and one book is coming out this year that I'll tell you about in just a second, um, but the other one is called Just Growth. Uh, we wanted to understand not just the places that are successful in linking growth and equity together, and there's lots of correlations that show that those go together, but how and why? Those regions that are successful, how have they been able to do it? And why is it that greater equity contributes to economic growth and vice versa? And so the first step was to identify those regions that have been successful. And without going into all the technical details, we looked at the largest 198 metropolitan regions in the US. It's every place that has more than 200,000 people in it. Um, we developed an index that combines multiple measures of economic growth over multiple time periods and multiple measures of social equity over multiple time periods. Um, and so we put it together into an equity index on the bottom and an economic growth index on the side there, divided that up into thirds. And what we were really interested in is those regions in that green box up there, which were in the top third on the equity dimensions and the top third on growth. Those are the places that are really just growth regions. Now, the red are pretty interesting, too, because those are the places that are like the worst off and trying to understand why are they so bad off. And we actually saw some patterns where places were able to shift fortunes over time. You know, in one decade, they might be in the red, the next decade in the green. We wanted to understand those shifts. But this is the map of what those regions look like in that period from 1980 to 2010, 30-year period of major economic restructuring. And I know you all are looking at, like, where's Stanislaus County in there? Um, you can see in California, it's a little hard to see with the light, but those dark red areas is the San Joaquin Valley. So probably no surprise. Now, it turns out that Stanislaus County is a little better than the rest of the San Joaquin Valley in terms of economic growth. It's been that middle category of economic growth over the 30-year periods. But the equity dimensions are in the bottom third as well. Um, but what I want to do with kind of the time that's left for me now is tell you uh, a few more stories. I, I could talk a lot more about the quantitative uh, work that we did. We looked at a lot of regressions, equations, and lots of numbers. And um, it always reminds me of, um, you know, the kind of person who becomes uh, an economist like myself. It's someone who's um, very good at math but doesn't have an engaging enough personality to become an accountant. <laughs> so I became an economist. Um, so I won't bore you with all of that, but I want to tell you a few more stories about places that have been successful. Um, one of which is Kansas City. Now, I mentioned the importance of that regional government in Jacksonville. Now, Kansas City was an important case for us because it does not have a regional government. It has a highly fragment, fragmented system of local government within the region that's much more typical of most places in the US. 
The Kansas City metropolitan region, it covers two states, highly divided. Actually, one was a slave state and one was a free state back to the Civil War, and that still has reverberations today. It's nine counties, 160 cities. It's a really complex place. Now, every region in the US uh, has a council of governments. Um, that serves as what's called a metropolitan planning organization. And I say every region has that because if you want federal transportation dollars, federal government has decided you have to have a regional planning organization. Most places in the country, the regional planning organization just plans for transportation infrastructure. In a few places in the country, the MPO, Metropolitan Planning Organization, links land use planning with transportation planning. Now this is kind of a no-duh thing because where you put housing and where you put jobs might have some influence on what kind of transportation infrastructure you should have. But actually in very few places do those two functions get connected. Kansas City is remarkable because in this Mid-America Regional Council, they have collaboration amongst 160 cities and nine counties in two different states, not just on land use planning and transportation planning, but also economic development planning and services for everything from early childhood education to services for the elderly. Environmental services, health services, they even had an international trade department to try and promote economic development. One of the things that they did was also pull together what they called Metro Outlook Live, which was a model of the regional economy in three different dimensions. It was the um, natural environment, that's the green one at the top. It was the economic environment, that's the blue in the middle. And then the community environment in the red at the bottom, what's going on in neighborhoods and communities and social organizations. And they started tracking this over time and it became an important information source for the community. Um, again, one of those just growth regions. Uh, Salt Lake City turns out to be um, one of the most equitable regions in the country uh, back in 1980 and has continued to outperform other metropolitan regions after that. Uh, most people think of Salt Lake City as a pretty homogenous place. A um, lot of uh, Mormons, the Church of Latter-day Saints. Turns out Salt Lake City is going through a demographic transition more rapidly than the country as a whole. Very rapid, uh, mostly Latino immigration. It'll become a majority minority region uh, sooner than the country as a whole in about 2038, 2039, something like that. But even more importantly than that, it's been incredibly open to immigrants. So undocumented immigrants in Utah have been able to have a driver's license, which in California just happened in January 1st, 2015. In Utah, it happened in 1999, more than 16 years ago. Um, undocumented students in Utah have been able to pay in-state tuition at state universities since 2002. Uh, there were a number of organizations, including major uh, chambers of commerce and economic development organizations that led a discussion in 2008 that led about immigration that led to be something they called the Utah Compact, which is a set of principles about how we want to talk about the issues of immigration in our society. And those principles included things like the importance of keeping families together, so you don't want to be deporting parents of kids that are citizens. Recognizing the economic contributions of immigrants to our society and a whole series of other things that tried to create principles of um, you know, discussing the issue. So how is it that Salt Lake City has been able to be so successful on both equity and growth and welcoming to immigrants? Well, the influence of the Mormon church I think is a big part of it. And it's about half the population of Salt Lake City now that are Mormon. But there's two features of the Mormon church that I think are critically important. One is young people um, spend two to three years, most of them overseas, doing missionary work and social um, service work in countries all over the world, but many of them in Latin America, Mexico, Peru. It's actually large numbers. Uh, the majority of Mormons in the world now are outside of the US, um, mostly in Mexico and Peru, but some in Eastern Europe as well. And so they come back having spoken the language, had an experience of being an outsider in a foreign land, and I think that's a big part of the welcomingness of it. But the other thing is the Mormon church has a lay clergy structure. So the bishop in the local unit of the Mormon church 
um, is someone who's called to be a bishop, all men, so there's some gender issues in the church, um, but they tend to be successful businessmen, successful local leaders. One of the things that they do in that role is administer a provident fund. Mormons are expected to fast one day a month and give the money that they would have spent on food to a local fund to help the less fortunate. And the local bishop is responsible for not just handing out those funds to those in need, but really providing uh, a hand up. So not just a hand out, but a hand up. Uh, and not just Mormons. It's people throughout the whole neighborhood and community who are in need. So where else in the country do we have a systematic process where CEOs, business leaders, local leaders spend three to seven years as social workers and understanding the experiences of the less fortunate. Now the other thing that's important in Salt Lake City is a small little nonprofit called Envision Utah that acted in many ways similar to that Mid-America Regional Council in Kansas City, but in a state that's highly suspicious of government it happened through a nonprofit structure. And they initiated a region-wide discussion about what do we want to look like 20 years from now? Where do we want jobs to grow? Where do we want housing? What kind of transportation do we want? And what they discovered is that if you're talking about a development initiative that's going in tomorrow, people will fight a lot. Right? The developer has their economic future tied up in that development. The local community who's opposed to it is going to fight tooth and nail because they know it's going to go in. So those are big fights. But if you're talking about what we want to look like 15, 20 years from now, turns out we all have a lot in common. You know, we all want to live in safe communities. We want clean air. We like you know, safe roads and bike paths and jobs that are accessible. And so that became a basis for bringing different constituencies together. And Salt Lake City now actually has the best mass transit system by certain measures of any metropolitan region in the country that's partially come out of this Envision Utah. Um, I'm going to tell you two more stories quickly uh, and then wrap up. So one is Oklahoma City. And this is a really interesting case because in the 1980s, Oklahoma City's economy was in the doghouse. It's in real pits. Part of the savings and loan crisis of the 1980s and a downturn in the oil industry. And they had pinned a lot of hopes on economic growth on attracting a United Airlines maintenance facility to the local airport. It's a lot of good jobs, good working class jobs in maintaining airlines and a major hub. And it provided a very typical package of subsidies and tax breaks to attract United Airlines there. And at the last minute, despite Oklahoma City providing a better package, United Airlines went to Indianapolis instead. And so local leaders were highly disappointed in trying to figure out what to do about it and realized that they couldn't count on attracting business from outside, but they had to build from their own resources. So what they did is the Chamber of Commerce, predominantly Republican, uh, and what is now four different Republican mayors, uh, got together and advocated for and got a majority of a conservative electorate to vote for higher taxes for major public sector investments in projects that essentially was a public works project. But it was centered on, in this case, the first round was called MAPS program, Metropolitan Area Projects. Nine different projects. It included a new convention center, a new basketball arena that became the home of the Oklahoma City Thunder, their first major league sports team. Uh, they uh, renovated the river used to be jokingly called the river you have to mow because it was so overgrown, but they dredged it out, created a series of um, you know, river lakes that is now a major Olympic training facility for crew. Uh, it's won all sorts of awards for that. They have a minor league baseball stadium, sort of a downtown um, entertainment district. Part of what was critical about this is that citizens voted for all nine projects together. You couldn't vote for one or the other. It was just a package deal. And so part of the appeal was, you know, you like the symphony hall. Are you going to give up the symphony hall just because you don't like minor league baseball? So you see the connections between different things. It was also a temporary tax. So six years, we'll tax ourselves and build these projects. Now part of what's critical in the Oklahoma City case is it's also largely a regional economy. It got there through 
very aggressive annexation in the 1950s and 60s. Oklahoma City went from 50 square miles to 650 square miles in the space of about 10 years. So when you add a 1% sales tax to a full regional economy, well, now you're talking about some real change that you can use to invest in these different projects. So at the end of those six years, they actually extended it a seventh year because who would have known the Oklahoma City Federal Building was bombed during that time. It slowed things down a little bit. But they still delivered on all these projects on time, on budget. And so people could see the value of the importance of that public sector initiative. So when they went for a renewal of that tax, and this time it was for the education system, for putting in new technologies and new infrastructure, and in this case, starting with the predominantly African-American neighborhood and high school, because the African-American community had felt a little left out in the first round. Um, and again, got a, even a higher portion of the population, over 60% in that case, to vote for uh, increased taxes. Uh, and again, have completely turned the economy around and improved uh, their performance on equity compared to other regions. So one last case, San Antonio, Texas is an interesting case, but I'm going to stick, skip it for the moment. Um, and this last one is uh, Seattle. And I do want to say we looked at statistically the relationship between being a just growth region and political affiliation, measured by the percentage of voters that were reporting, uh, voting Democratic or Republican. And there's no association, just no correlation at all. You can be a just growth region if you're a Republican metropolitan region or a Democratic region. But what we looked at then also is the disparity in voting patterns between voters in the central city or county and the surrounding suburbs or surrounding counties. And the greater disparity there is in those voting patterns, the less likely you were to be able to sustain growth and have greater equity. So the more similar you are throughout the whole metropolitan region, the better off. Seattle's an interesting case, typical, you know, liberal, democratic city. Um, and it has a long history here of sort of interracial alliance building from the 1960s. There were four guys who were known as um, the Four Amigos, um, who helped unite uh, the Latino community, the Asian community, the Native American community, um, and the African American community um, over like a 20 or 30 year period. But the other things that has emerged in the Seattle cultural is something they call the Seattle process. You can Google it, it shows up on Wikipedia. And again, this is a process where rather than voting and getting 50% plus one on any big issue, you bring together key stakeholders. And this emerged most prominently recently in Seattle's effort to pass a $15 an hour minimum wage in the city. And the mayor won running on a campaign of $15 an hour. Um, he had a majority on the city council who would have voted that. There were a number of other candidates who ran for it. But rather than just passing a policy and get it in, he created a task force on inequality in the city whose goal was to come up with a policy that would work for everyone. And he put on that council you know, local business people, the restaurant association, local hotels, the chamber of commerce, and the trade unions and the local community organizations. And they had a whole series of debates about, well, how fast are we going to get to $15 an hour? And do you provide exemptions for companies that provide health care and other benefits? And do you treat big businesses differently than small businesses? And they came up with a policy that was agreed to of the 24 people on this panel by 22. And the two that abstained or voted against it, one was the head of the Chamber of Commerce, and she said, oh, I just need to check with my constituency a little more. I think it's actually a good policy, but given the time demands, I can't vote for it yet. And the other side was the socialist member of the city council who said, we need $15 an hour today. Um, but everyone else was on board. And that's very typical of a set of processes that go on in Seattle at bringing that together. Okay, so I've told you a number of stories. Um, what does it all mean? Now, if you have any exposure to professors and academics, you, you know that when we go out and do a research project and gather a bunch of data and try and pull it all together and figure out what does it all mean, um, there's, there's two things we have to do. One, we have to say we've discovered something new. Uh, it's better if we give it an erudite sounding fancy name so it sounds obscure. 
Uh, and then the other thing we have to do is say, well, we're not 100% sure, so we need some more research funds to investigate it a little further. That's our full employment program in the academy. Um, so we've done that. Um, but I'll let you in on a secret in a second. So what we think is going on here is that in those successful regions, there are emerging over time and being sustained what we're calling diverse epistemic communities. So epistemic is just knowledge, the nature of knowledge. And there, it turns out there's a whole literature and research on epistemic communities that are defined, as you can read it there, it's like-minded networks of professionals whose authoritative claim to consensual knowledge provides them with a unique source of power in decision-making processes. And we think what's happening in these regions is those regional knowledge networks are particularly diverse and dynamic in their structure and content. Um, and here's the tricky part that we don't write in academic journal articles, but is really all you need to know, is that it's about not just what you know, but it's who you know it with. And why is that important in today's economy? Well, the key thing in our information economy is what drives economic growth is innovation. It's understanding changing competitive conditions, changing technology, changing global patterns, and being able to develop new products and services that consumers want all over the globe, as well as in the US. And we know that to do that effectively, you cannot do that as a single company. It depends on clusters of companies working together, the whole supply chain and the suppliers for that. It depends on the community colleges that train people and the universities and the public schools that go into those industries. It depends on the very knowledge that young people have about what are promising careers, promising occupations, where am I gonna be spending my time and energy and effort and not spinning my wheels and going in the wrong direction. And when these diverse and dynamic epistemic communities exist in a region, the regions are more effective at innovative, innovating, identifying those new and diverse economic opportunities, and being able to respond collectively. So rather than fighting about, you know, who gets which little piece of the pie, it's being able to coordinate together and figure out how do we grow as a community together and identify these new opportunities and figure out what are the changing structures we need. And the inclusion part, the equity part, is perhaps more obvious because you're connecting these geographies and connecting populations and expanding those structures of opportunity over time. So it's not even necessarily so much about new policies. Although policies like a raised minimum wage I think are very important. But even without those redistributive policies, you're making these connections and changing the structures of opportunities that create equity along with that economic growth. And I just want to say one final thing about education and an adult education that's part of that. Because I said at the beginning, I think we need much more attention to lifelong learning. And the ways that someone in their 30s, 35, 40, they get laid off because their company goes out of business or the industry changes or there's new global competition. How do you go back and get the skills to get into a new line of work, a new business? And we have very little supports for that in this society. And we need to expand that, invest in that over time. And those tend to happen within metropolitan regions in which an adult education infrastructure that includes um, community colleges are a critical part of that. And these are sort of some final points that I think are critically a part of that is we need to be thinking about this innovation economy and not thinking so much about jobs. I mean, jobs are obviously very important, but we need to be thinking about careers. And if you no longer can have a career within a single company where the company is responsible for that and helping to facilitate that pathfinding, what are the institutions that we need in place to help support people in navigating those lifelong careers? And that workforce intermediaries are a key part of that. Um, and one of the books that we have a chapter in is called Connecting People to Work, which is, a, I think, an important book that lays out some of that. The earlier book I mentioned is called Just Growth. We have a new book coming out from University of California Press. Should be out in about four months. Um, we're actually very pleased it's under an open license system that the University of California is just launching, so it will be available free in its electronic form. 
um, and it's called uh, Equity, Growth, and Community. And it's some subtitle about linking regions and lessons from regions to the nation. Uh, we have a website, justgrowth.org, where you can find out more information about this. Um, thank you very much for your attention, and I look forward to your questions and comments and feedback. There's a hand in the back there, or one right here, too. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Oh. Yes, I'm wondering. It seems like we've lost some political parties in the last couple of years. I don't see the Greens appearing on my ballot and the American Independent and all the rest. So how is that going to impact the distribution of power, political power, now that we've changed California's um, primaries. You know what I'm talking about? I do, you know, absolutely. And I'm just trying to, um, I, I don't spend a lot of time looking at party um, politics. Um, I do think that there are some really important changes that have happened in California's electoral structure in the last couple of years. One is, you know, a citizen commission driven effort to create congressional districts and state assembly districts, which makes it much harder to gerrymander districts to create safe um, district. So it requires a greater attention to the middle, a greater attention to collaboration than I think than in the past. And because we have this, you know, first two past the post in the primary now, um, I think that also facilitates collaboration and trying to cross boundaries rather than being entrenched in our partisan differences. But I would say nationally, um, a greater issue that we need to focus on rather than, oh, is there a third party besides the Republicans and the Democrats, is to really look carefully at the influence of money on our electoral system. Um, and it's getting some publicity now. People may know the Koch brothers who are going to spend as much in this next electoral cycle as either of the political parties on their own. And regardless of your political affiliation, I would say that that's disturbing when two guys can have as much influence as a whole political party. Um, when you look at, there's a great book by a guy named Lawrence Lessig called Republic Lost, which really tracks out the role of money in national politics. Our elected representatives in Congress now spend anywhere from about 30 to 70 percent of their time fundraising, just raising more money to keep their job for the next election cycle, rather than paying attention to the issues here. And when you look at the issues that are covered in Congress, compared to the priorities of the electorate, the issues match pretty well the priorities of the top 5% and are largely disconnected from the priorities of the bottom 95%. Um, and that has to do with the role of lobbyists and the role of money in elections. And so we need to figure out some way of changing the role of money in elections. And Lawrence Lessig and others have a bunch of proposals about how to deal with that. Um, but I think that's something we need to pay a lot of attention to. Hi, uh, in the back there, yeah. Hi, yes, uh, my name is Joel Campos. I'm an urban planning student at San Jose State. Right. And, um, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm kind of sick. <clears throat> but my question is, do you know if Stanislaus County uh, Council of Governments uh, incorporates land use planning with their transportation planning? And my second question is um, separate. Would, would you argue you that that's more important than creating one large metropolitan planning organization for the whole valley, such as the Bay Area does? Mm -hmm. So it's a really good question. Um, and I don't know uh, Stanislaus County um, Council of Governments very well. I do know through much of the San Joaquin Valley, there's been a serious discussions over the last four or five years around um, uh, it's a bill called SB 375. It's part of um, our climate change legislation. Um, so Daryl Steinberg led an initiative, whatever it is, 10 years ago now, to pass AB 32, which was our effort to cap greenhouse gas emissions um, and reduce them over time to uh, ultimately 80% of what they were in 1990 by 2050. 
And there's a companion bill connected to that that links with land use planning that, um, I forget the exact title, but it's around a sustainable communities um, planning that provides both a carrot and a stick to these regional planning bodies. And the, um, the carrot is for new developments that are um, in location efficient places. So these are places that have good transit access, are close to jobs, et cetera, that those kind of projects can get a streamlining of approval under the California Environmental CEQA, Environmental Qualities Act. Um, so that's the carrot. If you build in the right place, you can build faster and get around the regulatory structures. Um, the stick is that each regional planning body has to specify how they're going to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and if they don't meet those targets, then they can lose some state fundings around that. So Stanislaus County, as one of eight Council of Governments in the San Joaquin Valley, has had to, over the last um, four or five years, come up with their sustainable communities strategy, which links, for the first time, statutorily, land use planning with transportation planning. Now the challenge of that though is, is that if you're looking at greenhouse gas emissions and transportation planning, it really doesn't make a ton of sense to look just at Stanislaus County. I mean, there's people arguing we should have all eight counties of the San Joaquin Valley planning together as a regional body, because you know people drive back and forth across county boundaries all the time. Um, and there's been discussions to try and bring that together. At the moment, at the moment it's informal communication. Um, not formal planning body, so I think that's happening. Um, sorry, what was the second part of your question? Uh, oh, it, well, you kind of answered it. It was, uh, would you argue more for land use planning and transportation planning in one cog? Oh, or yeah, across the others, yeah. I think it's, you know, it's better to collaborate across that, but the one point I would say is there have been initiatives around the country to merge cities and counties. Um, Similar to what I described in Jacksonville. Actually, in, in Sacramento, we've had three different votes over the last 20 years um, to merge the city and county. Those kind of efforts are um, heavily contested, take a lot of money, um, and rarely succeed. They have exceeded, succeeded in a couple places. Louisville was one. Um, so I tend to be more an advocate of collaboration and communication. How do we work together given the existing um, structures, but that does create certain limitations as well. Over here, Chris. There we go. Um, my question is similar. I was wondering, um, since most of the lecture was about ideas relating to the Central Valley rather than directly, if you can maybe synthesize some of the ideas you presented on econo uh, successful economic growth to the future of this Central Valley, or maybe Modesto specifically? Yeah, so I don't know the Modesto economy specifically enough. I, I have spent some time in Fresno and looking at the Fresno economy. and. You know, part of the challenge there, and I imagine there's some similarities here, is the Fresno economy in that area is dominated by three major industries. Um, one is real estate development and kind of residential growth, and developers really dominate that. Um, the other is agriculture, of course, and all that goes along with that food processing. And then the third is oil. Um, Kern County in particular is stronger with oil, but Fresno has some of that as well. Um, and those are three industries that don't have much incentive to talk to each other. And part of the challenge is, like many of the agricultural companies, some of the bigger companies, and here we were talking over dinner about Gallo and Blue Diamond and others, you know, they're global companies that don't have much rootedness in the local community. Um, and similarly, of course, with oil. Um, developers have a lot more um, rootedness in the local economy, um, but don't have much incentive to collaborate on a diversified economy. And there's actually a whole storied history in um, Fresno County and um, Clovis and Fresno of real corruption. I mean, an FBI investigation of city um, officials who were zoning um, in preference to or benefit of local developers who are converting agricultural land to urban land to you know make money off of converting that. One of the city council persons there had a license plate that was actually called rezone on it. Um, eight people went to prison or something like that. Um, so real challenges. I think the thing that's needed is figuring out how to diversify the economy 
and find those business leaders who have a deep rootedness in um, the local community, who care about that and see a long-term future. And I think the more that we can get sort of visioning processes together, so we're not talking about like what are we doing next year or this, you know, next week, but 10 and 15 years out. And one of the things that was kind of exciting in the Fresno area was um, the city of Fresno started to develop a new uh, city plan renewal process and created a vision that said, well, you know, the downtown has become emptied out. Uh, and it's kind of an eyesore and there's a lot of problems. How do we get more people coming back downtown and revitalize and renovate downtown? And part of that is we've got to stop this sprawl out on the suburbs. But part of that was thinking long term, five, ten years down the road. And it got a lot of unusual allies to the table together. So some of the agricultural interests and particularly more of the local farmers who um, you know, actually wanted to preserve the farmland and um, you know, wanted to see that happen, actually became big supporters of that. You know, the, the joke is, you know, farmers are strong defenders of preserving ag land until the urban fringe comes to the boundary of their property. And then they're strong advocates for urban sprawl because they can get more money out of converting their land. But the trick is then how do you plan longer term and create real growth boundaries that are going to redirect growth downtown? And that will create the kind of communities that our young people want to live in. I mean, there's some really cool new restaurants and entertainment places in downtown Fresno. I mean, I had a chance to hang out with some people down there, and it's like, ah, it's kind of a happening place, and there's some nice artwork going on, and some nice culture. And people, you know, under 35, those are the kind of places they want to live. And so if you can create that kind of vibe, you end up keeping people there rather than the whole brain drain process of moving abroad. Or also then figuring out um, what I think of as brain circulation. So how do you get those people who've gone to the Bay Area and gotten connected to other jobs and opportunities there to come back to the San Joaquin Valley as a place you know, to raise kids and have a good, stable, solid life and a nice place to live away from the high housing costs and you know, drive and craziness of the Bay Area to have, you know, a decent quality of life. So how do you get them, rather than bemoaning them leaving, how do we then bring them back with all the skills and networks and social context they've made during that process of moving away to help build our local economy? So I think that's part of the answer. It's certainly no silver bullet, but it helps point to some directions. So I have two questions. One's um, for I mentioned I think 30 or 40 counties in the nation are kind of uh, the battleground states, what they mentioned for. Uh, I was speaking there of congressional yeah, districts. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, for those pl um, con congressional districts, would you consider them less, uh, I think you mentioned epistemic? Would they, would they be less like that diverse epistemic communities because of those ideologies, you know, so differing? And uh, does that hurt those communities because there's so much pressure on them? Um. It's an interesting question. And I mean, you know, congressional boundaries meander like this and are all sorts of funny shapes. And so they don't necessarily link very well to local economies or cities or communities. And so I've never looked specifically at that question. Um, but I think if you have a competitive district, the incentive is how do you speak to the majority of people in that district overall? Not the majority of party activists that are likely to vote in the primary. Because when you don't have a competitive district, your whole incentive is you got to get activists out in the primary, because if you win the primary, you've won the election overall. And so there's a, an incentive to be extremist, whether it's to the left or to the right, in your positions. Whereas if at least it's a competitive district, you've got to be figuring out how to speak to the middle. So I th it should promote a more diverse epistemic community. And I think. one other thing is, um, how does, this, uh, how does uh, this growth and epistemic growth uh, work for rural communities? And how does this city growth and this, does that actually hurt rural communities or does that help them kind of give a basis how to work off of? Yeah, it's a really good question about rural communities. And, you know, they're the complexity of rural places. 
um, becomes really important to understand. Because some rural places are um, on the periphery of big urban places. I mean, you go to Tracy, and what's driving Tracy is spillover from the Bay Area. Um, and that's really much driving. So other rural places would be like much more the San Joaquin Valley, where you're dependent on the local ag industry and you know other kind of natural resource industries. But you know people often talk about the whole San Joaquin Valley as being rural, but Fresno is a big city in many ways, and you know Modesto is a good medium-sized city, and it's got a lot of their typical urban conditions. So is that rural or not? And that's very different than if you go up into the foothills of the Sierra Nevada or other places where you know it's really the recreational industries that are driving economic growth. So I don't think there's one generalization we can make about rural areas. I was just, uh, how, how they interact. Yeah. So I mean, that's part of what I was going to kind of point to is most of my work has been on metropolitan regions, which tend to be the, the way it's defined in the U.S. Census is those kind of urban centers and the surrounding communities that uh, are dependent on in some ways or commuting distance to those urban centers. So, you know, as I said, um, Modesto is a metropolitan region, Fresno is a metropolitan region. Um, in that definition, and so to the extent that that counts as sort of looking at rural areas, um, you know, I think they're very closely tied to each other. We didn't really look at places like, you know, Lake Tahoe or, you know, other, you know, lumber, timber dependent communities in Northern California or some things like that. I, I was just wondering if like the city planning in a, um, one city might hurt a rural area or help a rural area, mm -hmm. like setting, you know, um, outlines for how they can maybe grow that rural area or um, even become annexed. So like that, those boundary cities, how, how they... You know, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I, I'm not sure I have an answer for that other than trying to collaborate between the counties and cities that are part of that. Oh, this is a, yeah, right here. Go ahead. I'd, I'd like to ask about the title of your book, Just Growth, and the title of your website, Just Growth. I mean, obviously that has a double meaning, right. just meaning fairness, which you've talked on, but just meaning that growth is the only thing that matters. But it seems to me there are different kinds of growth that are not so helpful as others. Uh, for example, b before the re recession, Las Vegas was growing, booming city. Right. Cities in Florida were booming. Phoenix, Arizona was booming. The northern San Joaquin Valley, the housing market was booming. And of course, then the bubble burst and all of that growth, in terms of suburban sprawl growth, um, turned into a nightmare for hundreds of thousands of families who lost their home. These were among the worst places in the housing crisis and it hit hard by the recession. So it seems to me that just growth by itself, um, you really need to concentrate on the fairness aspect of it and not so much as growth is the only thing that matters because for Las Vegas and Phoenix and the northern San Joaquin Valley, um, the growth really hurt us in some ways. Mm. So I wonder if you have comments on that. Um, I agree, 100%. <laughs> no, I think part of what I'd say is um, by looking at a long-term time period like we have in these books, up to 30 years, um, those places that have boom and bust cycles um, typically don't show up well, unless we happen to catch it in a bubble, which in most cases we have it. And so we're really looking at these long-term trends that try and understand the volatility of the economy. Um, so we cover some of that. But I think part of your question, too, is recognizing that there is some growth that's really bad. Um, and when we measure GDP, I mean, you can have a company like the Silicon Valley companies, who in the early days had lots of toxic dumping and chemicals that ended up in the groundwater. And you know they created lots of growth in doing that. And then we had companies that made money cleaning up the mess that they had created beforehand. And that's counted as positive growth. Um, you know, similarly, there is, um, you know, 30, 40 years ago, people used to eat at home a lot more. And when you make and cook food in your home, that's not counted as economic enterprise. But when that food is made and cooked in a restaurant outside, oh, that's economic enterprise. Well, is that necessarily a good thing if people are working, 
two families in a household twice as hard with maintaining the same income and having to eat out more at fast food restaurants because they don't have time to cook at home. And you know, there's a whole bunch of things in the nature of growth that may be destructive as well as positive. And there's a whole set of research out there on how to create genuine progress indicators rather than GDP. Um, and I would really encourage people who are interested in that to, to look at. Actually, the Europeans have developed this overall, but there's also this thing called a genuine progress indicator that now Oregon publishes and Utah publishes and you know, a number of other states. Um, and we decided not to engage in those debates in this book, although I think they're very important I mean, these two books, because we were trying to appeal to the economics profession and sort of the mainstream of economic discourse in this country to say, even on your terms, where all we're just looking at is what kind of money is made. Whether it's good money or bad money, or just how much money is made. We're better off if we're a more equal society than if we're an unequal society, just on those simple metrics. Um, so it was really a very targeted intervention around the equity debate. But I think your points about we need to look much more depth of the nature of that growth are very well taken. It's a very good point. Okay, this has to catch the plane. Yeah, good. So that's the microphone, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry, it's, it's, it's oh, okay. okay. Well, we do have one here then. Okay. If they're quick and I'll answer quick, we can do both. We'll do both and then I'll end up. Hello. Um, so I, I was paying attention to the, the fly part where um, citizens uh, move out of their communities to better communities and such forth. Um, and so for those that stay behind and build up the community and um, are ready to accept those people to come back and, 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 and participate in the economy and, and um, is there any solutions to preventing those that stayed behind from um, you know the home values going up and them having to move out I guess I think it's referred to like gentrification mm -hmm. and also um, do you have any any advice for uh, the youth here um, to actively uh, participate with their leaders to um, oh, with topics like the with like this, um, instead of waiting like uh, as you refer to it, waiting for them to die. So. <laughs> I didn't use those terms, but um, let's take those questions. I'll take this one other question. I'll try and answer them both together. Um, my question kind of kind of goes with your with the part of your presentation when you um, kind of talked about where young people get their news, where, where they get their news sites, like, mm -hmm. you know, um, permanently me and per personally the only inf new, the only time I ever get any information is from like The Daily Show. Mm. And not from Colbert anymore because he's gone, but whatever. Um, <laughs> but to be honest, yeah, that's where I get my news. Uh, but I, um, uh, but recently I just started figuring out a lot of local issues here. Um, but I don't know if there's any way for us to, um, for us to at least be a little more engaged or at least be knowledgeable about issues like probably concerning our community or you know our local government here i don't know if they, there's any solution or if there's any uh, uh initiative you know that there that there could be starting for doing yeah, that yeah so those questions are pretty closely linked i'll start off with the gentrification issue because there are lots of mechanisms out there um, on how to prevent displacement. And I like to make this distinction between gentrification and displacement. If we think of gentrification as a process of attracting resources and people to um, blighted neighborhoods or historically poor neighborhoods, you know, generally that's a good thing for just about everyone if it doesn't include displacement. And displacement is where the existing residents get pushed out by increased housing prices and other factors. And there's a number of mechanisms you can use. And there's a great organization called Policy Link, it's policylink.org, that points to some of those. But you know, there's things like um, you know, rent control, that you can keep rents um, over time. There's all sorts of efforts to try and help people become homeowners. So you can actually have equity in the house as it goes up over time. You have to catch those early before housing prices go up, but you need to do that. There's community land trusts of ways of trying to take land out of the market um, that creates more permanent affordable housing. Um, and then there's all sorts of programs that we have for federal and state subsidies for affordable housing units. And you can have inclusionary zoning ordinances that require new developments to have a certain number of units preserved for affordable units to try and conserve that um, character of the neighborhood. They tend to be, um, whether they get 
implemented or not or effective or not depends on politics and the level of involvement and the ability to push that through, which comes to the second part of your question and your question of how do we get young people more involved and those that are more diverse and representing the future of our, our country. And I'll just give you one um, statistic, um, which has to do with voting patterns. Um, in the last election, 2014, mid-year election, um, the percentage of eligible 18 to 24 year olds so these are not registered, but eligible to vote, who actually voted, 8%. Right? That's a number that should shock all of us. 8% of the people who represent the future of our communities voted. And that's either a reflection of um, why aren't young people more involved? Or it's a reflection of why isn't our political system more open to the voices of young people? Like why should we care as young people to engage and vote on that process? I think it's some of both sides. But I think part of that is um, recognizing that getting involved in civic life in your local community Voting is just the tip of the iceberg, right? Um, decisions about where housing gets built and what kind of economic enterprises happen and you know, what are the social services that are being provided happen through all sorts of sets of discussions and processes that um, you know, only make its way to the city council after decisions have been made and it's just a question of ratifying it. And so figuring out how to create the organizations, and you know, again, I gave these examples of Envision Utah in Utah. So that was four staff people who led this region-wide planning process that involved literally 20,000 people actively engaging in a vision for the future of Salt Lake City. through either responding to online surveys, through participating in community meetings and producing that together. Um, you know, the Jacksonville Community Council, I think it's got three staff in a small nonprofit. So it doesn't take a ton of money. What it takes is influential people who have some commitment and ties and connections to these kind of issues and who are willing to use their time and energy and influence to pull together those diverse constituencies. We've started to see it in Fresno through um, this group Fresno Metro Ministries that's working through faith communities to bring together people around this long-term visioning for not just Fresno County but the whole San Joaquin Valley and you might try and connect with the work that they're doing and I think our faith institutions whether it's a synagogue or mosque or church are, are very important institutions in our communities to, to build on. Um, but it's figuring out then how do you engage in those conversations about what does our community look like today and where do we want it to be 10, 20 years from now and recognizing that formal political voting is one tool and just one tool. Um, and there's a lot more work that needs to go on. I'll mention one other organization. It's a group called California Calls. Um, and it's building a statewide network um, around what they call integrated voter engagement. Um, and it pays a lot of attention to voting and bringing in new and occasional voters, um, but linking it with community organizing so that you don't just vote once every two years or once every four years and that's kind of it, but linking it with the efforts to try and promote community development in our communities. So if you're interested in getting involved, look at CaliforniaCalls.org, I think it is. Um, check out Fresno Metro Ministries and uh, get involved. Thank you so much for your time and energy and efforts and hope to be in touch. Thank you, Chris. A couple of brief announcements before we head out. First of all, if you need proof of attendance tonight for your professors, you can come up and get that from me before you leave. And secondly, the next CEP event will be the film Fed Up in two weeks on April 2nd, dealing with the causes of American obesity, and we hope to see you there. Good night, everyone.